Good morning, people. We're here a little early this morning because we have, I have an appointment at six o'clock in more or less 24 minutes with a group of pilgrims to do a baptismal renewal here at Magdala because of their program. And they asked me to do that favor, so I will be taking care of them. And this allows us to see a nearlier moment before sunrise that I get to see every morning, but I usually wait for you to see the, the sunrise properly, to see the sun disk come up. And here we see this beautiful water. The quiet and the birds and the waning full moon up in the very center of the screen there, just left of those treetops. And we have very beautiful, inspiring readings this morning. Uh, powerful ones, really. And we have the... Don't go into all of that, but the very fact of the loss. Last night, I had a conversation, a little video conference with the family. A wonderful, wonderful family. Been amazing supporters for years and of our school in the, in the US. And the man now is in his final stage for sure with cancer. And his faculties are declining quickly, but he was able to open his eyes and, and smile and communicate love and understanding and awareness and answer the question. <laughs> It was interesting, but to see the family also, they also know the stage of life that's happening and to be saying farewell, to be accompanying. And this is part of the human lot. Even after the extraordinary revelation of the resurrection, we still feel the loss. And then Abram has to do all the practical things that happens when a family member passes to see about the funeral, the burial, to find a place. And that's a very interesting chapter, so the reading today doesn't, doesn't uh, cover all the details. I encourage you to take it out and read it. It's uh, very interesting. And Hebron is located just south of Bethlehem. It's also a troubled area in our times, and we need to pray for, for generosity of hearts on every side for God willing reconciliation on both sides, for renewal on both sides. The human family is always challenged to share our world together, fairly, justly, with respect for each other. Quite a challenge. And there Abraham uh, has a very strong principle and he wants to pay for to pay a just price for the place to bury his wife. In fact, when you go to Hebrew nowadays, you can see memorials, kenotaphs uh, of the patriarchs and matriarchs. And there was Sarah, the first one. And so, in this very human, yeah, very touching, humanly touching story of, of Isaac going, uh, being consoled by his wife and the process of his marriage. And what strikes me is Abraham's great sense of mission at this time. And he knows that his mission extends through generations he didn't see the total fulfillment of God's promises. I will make you the father of great nations. But he knows that he knows that God is faithful. He already has an experience of that. And he firmly digs in about alternative proposals for Isaac that the head of his household makes. I was also intrigued by that concept, the head of the household. Right here in Tiberias, 
we have the head of the household of Herod, the steward of his, his name is Chusa, and his wife is uh, Johanna, and she's one of Mary Magdalene's friends and companions and supporters of Jesus. And we see many times in the Bible the head of the household, the one who represents, who has the fullness of authority. In some parts, uh, it will be given the expression, the keys of the kingdom. The king doesn't need keys of the kingdom. The king has the kingdom. He owns it. But whoever has the keys of the kingdom administers the kingdom for the king. And so here we see Abraham addressing and instructing his servant how he has to arrange Isaac's marriage. And the beginning of the marriage, the celebration of the marriage, is very simple. Abraham took her into his tent. And this is what Boaz does for Ruth. And so this is a biblical image for marriage. And it's also interesting that this is the way God works through us. It works through ordinary things, the ordinary facts of life. Marriage, birth, life, growth, development. And eventually death. And in the next generation, salvation is handed on generationally. And we can jump forward into the gospel reading. Mercy I want, not sacrifice. Forgiveness of sinners. It's the call of Matthew. We're in chapter nine of Matthew's gospel now since yesterday morning. And People are disturbed that this questionable figure could become a disciple. When a questionable figure becomes a disciple, how do we react? Sometimes we have our own molds for piety and for redemption. But God is a God of redemption. And right now we could see our purple heron their squawk. I think it wants to come back this direction. It feels safer a little further away. Matthew recognizes the call and he gets up and follows him. And we are called to embrace many people. A neighbor, a new neighbor, a new child in the family, a new in-law, marriage of a child, a call to our heart. And he throws a party, he celebrates. And people are uneasy about this questionable character and his friends but Jesus is at ease there he is at home there he's coming for it with redemption with a package of redemption and he's just so happy because so many people who need it are there with him I did not call come to call the righteous but sinners I desire mercy not sacrifice and I just finish off with a line from the psalm today Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 106. People, let's leave it like that for this morning, short and sweet. God bless you. See you later, alligators. There's Mount Arbel behind me in the background there. God bless you. Pray for us.